Are you sure this is necessary? Yes, I know, Nay. This is the only way to make sure you don't make any Rock'em Sock'em robot jokes. Trust me, it's for your own good. Look, Sci-Fi Guy, I understand that the comparisons between that and Real Steel are painfully obvious, but I think people really want to hear them. I mean, who didn't grow up playing Rock'em Sock'em? <laughs> good. It's working. Damn it, that hurts! What hurts? You know, this thing on my head that shocks me if I say rock and sock! <laughs> oh, I love these dumb jocks. Alright, screw it, I'm just gonna talk about the movie now. Released in 2011, Real Steel tells a tired and overused story about a washed up athlete getting a second chance while connecting with his estranged son. We've all seen this a million times, so how does this movie try to keep it fresh? by setting it in the future with giant boxing robots, of course. So naturally, when this movie came out, everybody and their grandmother was making jokes comparing it to ro- That game. What game? Duh, Rock'em so ah! <laughs> I'm gonna need a snack. Ah, this is great. <sighs> okay then, let's get to the movie. So the first thing worth mentioning is that the movie's music is composed by none other than Danny Elfman. Great! Who doesn't love Danny Elfman? So, how do we start out this movie scored by Mr. Elfman? With a horribly inoffensive acoustic guitar song that you hear in just about every commercial for camera phones and calling plans. That's right, when you need a quiet, droning song to appeal to all the people who look suspiciously like the people in the picture that came with your photo frame, you can always count on All My Days by Alexi Murdoch. Thanks, Alexi, you unwashed hippie! Our washed-up former boxer for this story is Charlie, played by Hugh Jackman. Charlie is a former boxer turned small-time robot boxing promoter. He arrives at a county fair in Texas to enter a fight with his robot named Ambush, but he won't be facing another robot. Instead, Charlie's rival and fellow former boxer, Ricky, has a different opponent for Ambush. Coming today, he's last year's runner-up in the baddest of the Bulls competition, ladies and gentlemen, Blake Thunder! Oh, this is gonna be hilarious, isn't it? It is! I mean, would you look at it? It's a giant robot punching a 2,000 pound ball! It just looks so stupid! And this is the first fight of the movie? What next? Is Ambush gonna go one on one with a shark to puss? Well, no, because Ambush is defeated by the bull, which means Charlie now owes Ricky $20,000. He doesn't have the money, though, so he tries to get out of town before Ricky can catch up to him. As he starts to leave, two men approach him and inform him that his ex-girlfriend has died, and under Texas state law, he now has sole custody of their son, Max, whom Charlie hasn't seen since he was born. Wow, so he's a washed-up former boxer, a small-time promoter, a lovable underdog, and an absentee dad? Oh, Charlie, you're going to have so much character development! Charlie arrives at the courthouse, where he originally plans to just sign over custody of Max to his ex-girlfriend's sister, Deborah, and her wealthy husband, Marvin, played by that guy who I swear is in every other movie ever made. Like, seriously, even if you don't know this guy's name, which I'm sure you don't, you recognize him because you've probably seen him in at least ten movies or shows that you've watched. In fact, this is his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. But once Charlie notices how rich Marvin is, he comes up with a plan to get some money out of him. He will only sign over custody of Max for $100,000, half of it now and the other half at the end of the summer. In exchange, Charlie agrees to look after Max for just the summer, while Marvin and Deborah vacation in Tuscany. And the fact that Max is stuck with his deadbeat dad in a smelly gym when he could have been living it up in Tuscany isn't lost on him. It's been a long time. You know, I'm your... You screwed me. Nice mouth. Do you know where they're going? Italy? 
Yeah, Italy. So how did I get stuck here with you? Relax, kid. You've got a whole life of fine living ahead of you. Charlie! Dude's pissed. He's gonna oh. take off. Yeah, uh... Okay. Did Marvin give you that money? Here, here. Just close the deal. I'll be right there. Blah, 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 custody issues and money woes. Can we just get back to the rock and roll? Oh, good. For a moment there, I was worried you had learned. Damn it, why did I agree to this? Inside the gym, Charlie has just purchased a robot with his money, a former WRB, that's World Robot Boxing, champion named Noisy Boy. His friend Bailey tells him that this bot runs on voice commands, but Charlie can't get it to work. Right, left, uppercut. Doesn't work. Right, left, uppercut. I knew that price was too good to be true. Give me we a got second. Screwed. Let me see if oh. I can fix it. Look at God. Look how good he looks, too. Give two too seconds. Good. Let me look at something. Why didn't you ask the guy to have a look at it? Miggy, he died. Whoa, whoa. What was that? Was that Japanese? Um, uppercut on Nikai. Let me see if I can reset him to English. Hang on. How the hell do you know Japanese? Video games. You play video games in Japanese? Japanese bootlegs are always better. Wow, Juario's influence is far-reaching in the year 2020. After Max forces Charlie to take him along to his next fight, they arrive in an underground arena where Charlie enters Noisy Boy into the main event against the underground champion Midas. Finally, we get to see some giant robots fight each other. <laughs> To admit, despite the silly nature of it, this is actually a good fight. They keep the action moving and. <laughs> what the hell? I didn't say anything! Oh, you were thinking it, don't lie. So, due to Charlie's inexperience with Noisy Boy's voice controls, he loses the fight and is once again left without a robot or any money. He takes Max with him to a junkyard to find parts so he can build a new robot. It's so small. Ah, yeah, that's before your time. That's a Generation 1, the very first fighting bot. They wanted him to look like us. The more human, the better. Wait, this movie is set in the year 2020. Max is 11 years old, so if a Generation 1 bot is before Max's time, then that means robot boxing predates the year 2009. So how come we haven't seen any robot boxing yet? And did I just pick apart a logical inconsistency in a sci-fi movie? Indeed. Well done, young Padawan. Don't get too excited, I'm never going to be able to speak Klingon. But while Max is asking Charlie about his time as a real boxer, he falls down a cliff. Just as he's about to go all the way over, he gets caught on a robot arm. After Charlie pulls him up, Max decides to dig out the robot. The next day, they bring it back to the shop and power it up. Exterminate! No, it doesn't do that, it just sort of sits there. But Bailey discovers that this bot has a shadow function, allowing it to mimic people's movements, a rarity in boxing robots. The bot is named Adam, an early Generation 2 robot designed as a sparring partner for other robots. It's made to take a lot of damage, but not designed to deal much damage. But Max, taking his stubborn nature from his dad, insists that they enter Adam into a fight. That night, while everyone else is asleep, Max takes Adam out for a walk around the alley. Can you understand me? I do not understand what love is. Later, Charlie takes Max and Adam down to Atlanta to visit his friend Finn and try to get along. While Max is waiting for Charlie, he sees the WRB champion Zeus and the team behind him. They say your father's the money and you are the mind behind Zeus. You're very kind, but I assure you, the mind behind Zeus belongs to the great Takumashido. Nobody 
Take to lure the reclusive genius, former boy wonder, and arguably the most important bot designer in the history of the sport, out of retirement. Why don't you ask him yourself? The results of any fight is inevitable. What Zeus sees, he kills. <laughs> God, even the villains are cliché. A sexy Russian woman with lots of money and a reclusive Japanese genius, not to mention Ricky from earlier, a crazy-ass cowboy. What next? Some sort of Mad Max reject? He can fight my robot Metro. I really need to keep my mouth shut. So Charlie lets Max take Adam to the only place that'll let him fight, an abandoned zoo. Do they have a petting zoo? I would like to see some goats. They enter Adam into a fight against a robot named Metro, controlled by the guy who wrote the movie screenplay. No, really. Once the fight starts, Metro quickly takes control, dealing out some vicious hits to Adam. But it soon becomes apparent that Adam is capable of sustaining a lot of damage. He survives the first round, and a cocky Max bets our spiky-headed screenwriter double or nothing on the next round. Stop hitting yourself! Stop hitting yourself! Of course, Adam wins, and right after, a man makes him an offer for another fight. Have I got a fight for you Saturday night. Guaranteed four grand, seven if he wins. Four grand, you're on. Let's go. Does this mean no goats? So before the next fight, Charlie and Max stop at a motel. In the morning, Max teaches Adam some new moves. What is this? Real steel or you got so- ah! Oops, up. Uh, sorry, I also had it set to shock you if you mentioned terrible urban street dancing movies. Why would you ever need a setting like that? Because... reasons? Anyway, Charlie suggests to Max that he dance with Adam before every fight to pump up the crowds. Max agrees, but only if Charlie agrees to help train Adam to be a better boxer. And right about now sounds like a good time for a montage. Snatch him out of his uniform, leaving with socks, hard bottoms, and boomers on. You still fly kites daily. Catch me in my Mercedes. Yep, it's another sports movie cliche. At this rate, why would the movie stop with the cliches? I think the idea was to get people to do a drinking game where they take a shot every time the movie indulges in a cliche. That way, the drunker people get, the more they enjoy the movie. It's brilliant, really. After several more fights, Charlie and Max are invited to take Adam to a fight in a WRB match. Naturally, they accept, and once they get there, Farah Lemkova, the owner of Zeus, invites them up to her suite. I'd like to buy your robots, and for that I'm willing to pay. Two hundred thousand dollars. I will use him to hunt down moose and squirrel. Charlie wants to take the money, but Max refuses to sell Adam. Lemkova keeps her offer on the table until the start of Adam's fight against a robot named Twin Cities, which she doesn't think Adam can win. But Max is determined to prove her wrong. Right after he busts the move. I want to rock right now. I want to rock right now. My name is Adam, and I have come to get down. Something worth mentioning here is that once the movie gets to these WRB fights, there is suddenly a ton of product placement. This fight takes place at the Virgin America Spectrum, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's plenty of other products and logos to be found here. Now that is just shameful. I mean, just because I tolerate corporate sponsorship and product placement at every single sporting event I go to, doesn't mean I want to see that in my movies. Ah! That's the stupidest thing that I've ever heard, and you deserve that. Yeah, I probably did. 
So the fight begins and Adam is quickly overpowered by Twin Cities, which is bigger, has a longer reach, and no blind spot. But once it backs Adam into a corner, Charlie spots a tell in Twin Cities' arm before he throws a punch. He uses this to his advantage and gets Adam out of the corner. Adam is then able to take control of the fight, and soon after, Twin Cities is down for the count. As they celebrate their victory, Max suddenly takes the mic from the ring announcer. I challenge Zeus to a fight! Jeez, kid, it's a microphone. You don't have to scream into it. After the fight, Charlie and Max are about to leave the parking lot when Ricky approaches them with a couple of goons. Charlie offers to pay him extra, but Ricky is no longer interested in just the money. Now he wants to beat the crap out of Charlie, and so he does. He and his goons leave Charlie wounded and then take all of his and Max's money. Soon after, Charlie brings Max to New York City to hand him over to Deborah and Marvin, as was the agreement. But Max doesn't want to go. Trust me, kid. It's better this way. All right? I know you think you know what's right, but you don't. You're too young. You don't know. Look at me. Trust me. Legally, she has custody, so what, 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 what can I do? Okay, yeah, for the sake of saving time, I'm just gonna skip ahead to the part where Charlie asks for a second chance and Max forgives him. And I can't get those years back, Max, but, but I'm here right now. And if you're up for it, I'm ready to fight. Yep, called it. We then travel back to New York for the big fight. Ready for some more product placement? Welcome, everyone, to New York's big arena. The Bing Arena? Give it up, Microsoft. No one uses Bing now, and no one's going to be using it in the year 2020. Oh, and it gets even sillier. Yes, indeed, the Xbox 720. So, we'll be going from the Xbox 360 to the Xbox One, and then back to 720. Can't wait for that reveal at a future E3. The Xbox 720 will feature all the things you loved about the 360 and none of the bullshit from the Xbox One. Again, real sorry about that, guys. So, I'd like to talk to you about our new Kinect. Okay, okay, no more Kinect! Outside of the <laughs> Bing Arena, we see Charlie's friend Finn taking bets on the fight, and Ricky shows up to make a big bet of his own. There you are. Remember section? 101 row C, and you can bring me my money right to my seat. 101 row C, 100K. You heard me, homie. Homie? <laughs> right? Oh, <On> boy! <laughs> All right. Peace out, Fosse. I'll see you in Sad Monday. Ah! What the hell? I also have it programmed to shock you if you try to say the N word. Shame on you. Damn it, we agreed it would only shock me if I tried to say Rock'em Sock! Seriously? Guinea pigs learn faster than you. Anyway, the fight starts and right away Zeus lands a devastating hit to Adam, but Adam gets back up. Zeus knocks Adam down two more times, but he keeps getting up and manages to survive the first round, meaning Ricky is now out $100,000. Finn and his men come to collect, and they take Ricky away to presumably give him his come ups but we'll never know because we never see either of them again. Lame. So round two begins and... Uh... Ring card girls of the future! Seriously? Are we supposed to find this sexy? Is that going to be a widely accepted look for women in just seven more years? And is anyone really looking to pour thousands of dollars into making ring cards more advanced? I don't think I want to live in that future. As the fight continues, Adam manages to hold his own against Zeus, never staying down for the count. But late in the fourth round, Zeus lands a blow that disables Adam's voice command system, so he can no longer respond to Charlie's commands. After Adam is saved by the bell, Max switches him over to shadow mode, so that Charlie can control him with his movements. Bring it, Biatch! 
Charlie bides his time, waiting for Zeus to slow down, which eventually he does, and then he makes his move. Zeus's designer, Mashido, starts to panic and personally takes over his controls. What? Are you kidding me with those controls? Uh, Sci-fi guy, I am begging you, let me have this one. Just this one. Fine, just this once, and you're good. Thank you. So, as you can see, the controls that Mishido is using are exactly like the controls you would see on a game of rock and roll. Ah! God damn it, you lied to me! Oh, worth it. So the fight goes the full five rounds, and it comes down to the judges' scorecards. Ultimately, the judges rule that Zeus is the winner, but Adam is hailed as the people's champion. Max, Max, I... I really want you to know. No, I need you to know. I... Don't worry. Your secret's safe with me. So you won't tell anyone I wear women's underwear? What was that? Nothing. And that's real steel. It's corny. It's cliched. It has a ridiculous concept. And... And... And I friggin' love it. I mean it too. This is one of those movies where if you step back and look at it analytically, you can see that it's full of cliches and has a story that we've all seen a million times before. But, at the same time, it's so much fun that it practically doesn't allow you to not enjoy it. It sucks you in, and all kidding aside, it really does have good character development. Not to mention that the fights are just plain awesome. Really, the only times I laughed out loud at how ridiculous it was were the fight with the bull at the beginning and the futuristic ring card girl. That's it. Underneath it all, this movie has heart, and it's hard to not enjoy it. Okay, so can I please take this thing off now? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, but there is one more thing that I want to try. Yeah, what's that? Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Ah! Interesting. Your brain now responds with a sense of pain every time you hear those words. What? Well, how long will that effect last? Oh, not too long. Only until, like, your late 60s. You motherfuck! Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Ah! Damn you, science!